Good morning, good morning. Oh, it's a chilly morning. It's cold. Here we go. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, dear. Hang on a second. I'm going to have to put the blowers on. Might, might have to get out and scrape the windscreen. Bear with me for a second. Right, I think what we found out from that is that most of the ice is on the inside of the windscreen. This is what happens when you drive an old car. On this car, it defrosts the windscreen, maximum effect, if you turn all the knobs clockwise. So, you can hear it. I'm sorry about the blower noise. It won't be a second. Oh, we have to close off all the vents as well. It's not in any way automatic, this car. <laughs> anyway, how are you? Before we, before we get going, I'll well, just take this opportunity to have a little chat, shall we? Hey, that'd be nice, won't it? Yeah. So, what's happening? Today, the nurses have gone on strike for the first time in 100 years. Nobody wants to go on strike. I did a little bit of uh, talking about strike action the other day, having led a national strike. When the uh, dentists went out on strike, they uh, did so because they knew that it was pretty much the end of the NHS uh, dental service in any sort of meaningful or comprehensive uh, form. Um, and uh, we balloted our members, that's the General Dental Practitioners Association, established 1953. Um, and uh, we balloted our members and they came out in, uh, you know, in favour of uh, industrial action which in our case was uh, just our advice to, for, to them to reduce their reliance on the National Health Service. That was, that was our strike in effect, you know. And the British Dental Association, who felt a bit uh, left out and were worried about us gaining market share in terms of members, um, also uh, balloted their members. But then they made the mistake of um, the, their ballot question was, would you like to withdraw from the NHS? And uh, they, of course, they similarly, they got the support that they were seeking but um it was in favor of a it was in favor of an action which the dentist really didn't want to take you know and and didn't in the end really support them if they did in certain small areas like the isle of Wight and various other enclaves where uh the, the uh, choice of dentists was very restricted but um not not generally and so of course they became the laughing stock of the media and the public when um they didn't really all um there, there was no strike action in effect. But um, nobody wants to go on strike. I mean, the government uh, says, you know, uh, that nurses are striking for more pay, but they're not. They're not. <laughs> for the most part, if you want more pay, you don't go on strike. I mean, strike is the last thing you do. Uh, you go on strike to try and keep your house, or you go on strike to try and... Uh, pay the bills you know that's not you don't go on strike just because you think i want to pay rise i'm going to go on strike you go on strike when things are broken down you know and and you've already been in discussions with your employer for more money and they've said no and you're like well what else am i going to do you know i've got no choice i'm going to have to try and um put more pressure on them Oh, right. Goodness knows what you're seeing out of here. Oh, not much. Actually, slightly better than that. That's what I need to do, is I need to look in, drive along looking in there. But, uh, no, nobody goes on strike, and the nurses don't want to go on strike, and then they're being forced to go on strike, and they're not really very militant. I mean, you can imagine that's the first strike in 100 years. I mean, they're not very militant, are they, obviously? Uh, but they decided that they've got no choice. And this is a complete vault fast. 
for the government, that's an about face. Uh, for the government, because, they, you know, like two years ago, we were all outside banging pots and pans and clapping for the nurses. And now we're, we're saying that um, we don't think that they should um, get the money that they're asking for. Now, the government, um, you have to understand that, that when you go on strike, you have the full force of the government against you. Um, they, and it is imperative at the moment that the government is against strikers because um, they've got themselves caught between a rock and a hard place. They've printed all this money. The value of the pound has fallen in terms of what it can buy in, in goods and services. And... Um, And so uh, people are seeing a real uh, decrease in the standard of living. So they need to earn, you know, be paid more pounds to make up for it. But the problem is that the government, what they didn't realise and don't realise and should have realised is that when they printed all this money and effectively devalued the currency uh, in terms of its purchasing power, that they were going to need to compensate all the government employees uh, for the, de the, the fall in their standard of living. Now, in the private sector, we tend to compensate ourselves. So, I mean, you know, if the purchasing power of the pound falls 10%, we, we can put our fees up 10%. But a nurse can't put her wages up 10%, and yet their prices, that's the price of her labour, it's still just a price. And so forget all that guff about uh, wage inflation spirals and wage price spirals and that. It's just, um, it's just, the price of labour compensating for the decreasing uh, purchasing power of the pound. So with inflation, that uh, you know, they're celebrating that inflation has gone down from 11 to 10 percent. And, and it's the magic word down that they want. They want the word down in the headline. Inflation has gone down because people, when they hear the word down, they think, oh, that means that, um, I don't think we might be all right now. Oh, my windows are frozen. Oh, well, I can see through the windows. Here we go, here we go, here we go. Whoa, look at that. I'm a brave lad. I'm going the windy way, which on an icy day is probably not the best way to go. Famous last words. Yeah, so so everyone's like, oh, inflation's down from 11% to 10%. Now, what they should say is it's gone, it's, <laughs> inflation is now going up at 10% as opposed to 11%, which is only very slightly less. I mean, really, honestly, that's not a massive difference, is it? But um, what they're trying to do is they're trying to sell the narrative that inflation has peaked because they, first of all, they said that inflation was transitory. And then they said, there we are, let's turn that down a bit. Let's see if I can find a button that defrosts my windscreen. I think that's, that's it. Uh, the back windscreen. And then, so then having said it was tra transitory, when it's, you know, it's going over 2%, they said, oh, it's only, it's only, and everybody took that to mean that it's, uh, it's only going to go over 2% for a while and then come down to 2%, and then it shot up to 11%. So they forgot the transitory. They also forgot to apologise for the fact they got it so hopelessly wrong, and that they really don't know what they're doing, and they shouldn't be in charge of the of the uh, in, the interest rate. You know, the price of money. Any more than some central Soviet committee should be in charge of the price of women's clothes. It, it, it just no, they shouldn't. It shouldn't shouldn't be set by a Politburo. Anyway, um, uh, so now everyone's like, oh, it's come down to ten percent. Well. The thing is, that it's not. It's still um, positive because uh, interest rates are still only three percent, and expected to go up to three and a half percent today. So that's not really going to fix uh, inflation of ten percent, eleven percent, or even ten percent. All the time, it makes sense to borrow now and spend, rather than save your money and and spend a year later. No one's going to save. So inflation is going to. Uh, be with us for a long time and the reason why they can't put interest rates up to more than the rate of inflation and get inflation under control is because the government has printed uh, so many IOUs and spent so much money and it's got so many IOUs outstanding uh, on the foreign uh, you know foreign markets and also on the balance sheet of the 
Bank of England that they just can't afford to pay uh, more than about three and a half percent. Three and a half percent in America, they've calculated, is the most they can afford to pay before the government goes bankrupt and we have a sovereign debt crisis, you know, sovereign debt default, where the government just says, if you've got a government bond, a government IOU, then, um, you know, you thought we could print the money just to pay it back, but we're not, we're, because we're giving up printing money, you know, we can't print anymore, because nobody will buy any more of our IOUs, so we can't sell our IOUs to pay back the IOUs that we already owe. So, so the nurses are on strike, and uh, the government is, uh, you know, they're, they're not asking, in a way, they're not, it, it's like when the dentists were on strike, and we used to go and say, look, we've had a, our earnings have gone down in real terms since, you know, when they were recorded in uh, the, the review body uh, figures. And we used to say that our earnings have fallen in real terms and we need to be put back to where we were. We need to be made good, you know, we need to be remediated. And the, and the uh, review body would say something which I've heard judges say from time to time, which is, that, well, it is what it is, you know, or we are where we are. We have to start from here. The, the uh, offer we're going to make you is based on what we think you need now, you know, and it doesn't, I don't care if you had a heyday 10 years ago. I don't care if that just, well, you think we're reasonably paid 10 years ago and you don't think that now, you know, we're just going to pay you what we think that you're, will have to accept, not what you're going to be happy with. So what they do is they bring all their, um, uh, their apparatus to bear. And so you'll find that public support for the nurses' strike will um, be high to start off with. And I think it's started off with something like 70% approval. And now today's the day they're going to strike and they're down to about just over 50% approval, 30% against. Um, but this is in the face of the government coming on and, and all very much towing the same line, which is that the nurses want 19% and uh, that's not affordable. You know, the government has to be mindful of the finances and that, that's not, you know, that's they can't support that sort of pay increase. And also, like, if, if they give the nurses 19%, then what's going to happen you know, that's there. then the firemen are going to want 19%, then the police are going to want 19%, you know. So, um, I, I understand that the government has a massive wages bill, but, the, you know, I really don't think they should. I think they should. there should be a lot more separation of uh, goods and production and services from the state, and, the, and we should have a smaller government. So they've got no sympathy from me, and I'll come back to that point of no sympathy later. But the nurses are, you know, they've calculated to get them back to where they were, they need 19%. Now, I, I agree that that's probably, I don't think they're expecting to get 19%. I think they would expect to get 19 and they'd be happy with 10, you know. Even though 10 is not even a pay increase, that's the thing, you know. They always, the government will say, oh no, they want a 3% pay increase. Or we're going to give you a 3% increase in your pay. But in the, in the face of a 10% inflation, then 3% is not an increase in your pay. It's a sort of, you're in free fall, it's a decrease in your pay. And the um, the media, I think, we, we have a very weak media in this country, uh, very weak uh, understanding of how things work and, and an equally weak uh, narrative. Um, and if the, if the media were doing its job, they would be saying that like 3% that's on offer is a, is a is a pay cut, it's not a pay increase. <coughs> also, they'd be calling out these sort of stupid maths where they say, well, we're going to give you 11%, but we're going to do it over three years, you know, uh, which is another way of just making the pay rise look a lot bigger than it is. Or say, no, we're going to give you uh, 5%, but we're going to link it to um, increases in uh, or changes in your terms and conditions because uh, we can, you know, we can't change your terms and conditions normally without paying you to change them so and you're agreeing to those changes and uh, being compensated for those changes and so what we're going to do is we're going to sort of kill two birds with one stone and we're going to get some changes in your terms and conditions uh conceded as um as a part of the pay the pay rise and uh they'll do all sorts of things they already are doing them they'll 
they'll find a they'll find a government minister who's a nurse to come on and say that uh, actually nurses are not you know <clears throat> don't have a very good case and that the government needs to keep an eye on the public finances and and I am a nurse you know I am a nurse so some sort of uh, quizzing type nurse some Marshal Petan from the nursing profession is going to come on and so gently drip poison on the claim and uh, they've been told that they're playing straight into the hands of Vladimir Putin in other words that they're Russian sympathizers you know the thing that they tried against uh, Donald Trump that failed uh, to say that he's they're in cahoots with the, the Russian army uh, helping them invade Ukraine by asking for a higher pay rise <clears throat> and also that um, you know did, going on about what a high starting salary they have and how everybody else will be very happy to have to be have the sort of pay that a nurse gets paid and any stories about nurses being hard up or having to use soup kitchens and that are unsubstantiated and, and an insult to the uh you know to the people who do use soup kitchens and all this they've got a whole comms department that's working on this believe me and they worked on it with the dentists as well. When we were on strike, you know, the joke was going round about the dentist who, um, uh, you know, was was uh, shot and uh, was only saved because the bullet hit his wallet and uh, it stopped the bullet, you know. And so when we were trying to talk to people about uh, the, the real issue of whether or not the NHS dental service was going to, was being defunded in a meaningful way, and, uh, it, you know, that was the beginning of the end, really, for comprehensive, high-quality NHS dentistry for everybody. Um, you know, we got met by this joke, uh, by people saying, oh, yeah, have you heard the one about, you know? And we were like, well, okay, that's fine. I mean, we didn't have public support. We, we're dentists. We don't, generally, we don't get support, right? We don't get support. Again, I've mentioned this before, when, so I'll just gloss over it quickly, but when uh, HIV became a thing in the 80s, uh, if you were a, a cardiothoracic surgeon or an orthopedic surgeon or something, and you were operating on someone and the patient had HIV, then you were told. Uh, it, you, you had to be informed. If you're a dentist and you were taking out a wisdom tooth, working with the same thing, bone, blood, everything, um, that you were told that you... It was, it, everyone was told not to tell you. You were told... It wasn't that you weren't told, it was that the, the general view was that these dentists should not be told because um, the dentists are discriminatory and that what they'll do is they'll refuse to take on patients who are HIV positive. And uh, so they, they, uh, they will suffer discrimination if their status is known. And therefore, and dentists were included in that group, which was grossly unfair. The, uh, you know, when the sugar tax came in, sugar tax didn't come in came in because, hey, because the government needs to tax everything, including, you know, I mean, just, they're, they're, they just tax everything because they, they're so short of money. They've got a, uh, they've only got two sources of income. The government has got no money. They've only got two sources of income. They've got what they get in tax and what they print. And uh, so they have to tax everything and print the rest. And so they started taxing sugar, but it was ostensibly because they were spending so much money on diabetes uh, stuff, and which I think is all free. Uh, you don't, are you, I mean, anyway, you can get a prescription certificate for diabetes. And so, you know, the most you're paying is about a hundred pounds a year or something, uh, but I think it's free. And so, and everyone's getting diagnosed with diabetes. So the government was like, well, we've been told that sugar causes diabetes. So we're going to tax sugar. Um, and the dentists who've been campaigning for the last 20, 30 years for a tax on sugary foods um, on the grounds that, you know, that tax could be used to fund an NHS dental service because, they've got, if anybody deter, if anybody deserves to fund the NHS dental service, it's the Mars family. But we, we got absolutely nowhere until the government decided that um, the cost of treating diabetes was uh, they're going to try and partially recoup it by a sugar tax. And once again, the dentists are not involved in that or not consulted on it and not even credited as, you know, as being the beneficiaries of it. So anyway, I could go on. I've got a long list of grievances about where dentists have 
you know, on, on commissioning bodies where we've been left off commissioning bodies and not consulted, uh, uh, you know, insufficiently credited with our the body of knowledge that we've accumulated on bodies like NICE and stuff like that. Anyway, that's that's not the point. The point is that um, the nurses will, uh, the government will manipulate public opinion against the nurses in the same way as they manipulated public opinion against us. The only difference is with doctors and nurses, it's a bit more difficult for them, you know, to demonize a nurse. It's quite de easy to demonize a dentist. And uh, we got all this, you know, well, you know, the whole problem will be solved if um, dentists will just take a pay cut and dentists are all wealthy and they'll drive around in Ferraris and what on earth are they complaining about? Which is why when people come into my surgery today and say, that I've just moved into the area and I've turned up here because I can't, you just can't get into a dentist anywhere, you know? I've tried to get in everywhere on the NHS and you just can't get in. And there's two emotions go through my mind. First of all, like, I've never wanted to be a dentist of last resort. I don't, when people say that to me, my first inclination is to say, well, look, don't worry. Why don't you go now, leave, and or borrow my phone and just keep ringing around? You know, if you'd rather not be here, you'd rather be somewhere else, then let me help you end up at the dentist that you're happiest with. If you want somewhere that's dead cheap or somewhere that's dead quick or, I don't know, somewhere that, I don't know, even a woman dentist or someone that's got a hygienist that works on a Tuesday afternoon, I am going to move heaven and earth to get you what you want. But I do not want to hear that you've ended up with me because you ran out of other options you've got nowhere else to go and the other thing that goes through my mind is that uh, you are hoist by your own petard you know the the public uh, and this is a thought that will only a few people who live through it will understand that when we were trying to get public sympathy in the 1992 fee cut time and when we went all on strike and everything um, and the public were, for the most part, I would say, extremely unsympathetic. They felt the dentists were highly paid, couldn't see what the problem was. Uh, you know, they were told that, you know, dentists earned £200,000 a year uh, when that was, they, they were being quoted the dentist business income uh, before expenses and then not even the dentist income before tax. So, so we had no sympathy at all. We were really... People were concerned about uh, NHS dentists going on strike and they were a little bit curious and a bit befuddled by the fact that dentists might want to go on strike. We hadn't really been seen as a group that, you know, was... I mean, they knew they couldn't find an NHS dentist, but they didn't really think that, that as a result of that, the dentists would go on strike. But in fact, they were reassured by the, the uh, government, John Major's Conservative government, that, that everything had been sorted out and then the BDA made the this blunder of not being able to effectively take any action and so you know the government was able to point that there were still NHS dentists and and that was that was when the rot set in but I mean um, now for a patient to come in and say oh I can't get an NHS dentist anyway uh, anywhere I, I'm thinking well where the hell were you you know where the hell were you in 1992 where were you when we said that this was not a funding issue? Of, it wasn't a wage funding issue. It, it was a, it was a treatment provision system breakdown, and that they weren't funding the NHS dentistry properly. And as a result, most dentists would withdraw from the system because you can't provide a service for uh, five pounds that costs ten pounds to provide. Well, not without severely, severely, uh, you know, compromising on uh, quality and pretty much abolishing the inspectorate as a necessary step towards that. So, you know, I, I these people that don't have my sympathy on, on two counts. And I can see the nurses going the same way. I think that uh, what will happen is that they'll keep pouring dripping poison on the nurses and saying that, uh, you know, they'll come up with a nurse who's perhaps, uh, you know, uh, covering sessions for two thousand pounds a session or whatever and the nhs is having to pay the bill and then they'll come up with a uh, someone who's died or had their cancer misdiagnosed as a result of their appointment being put off because of the nurses strike and stuff like that 
and and you get all sorts of idiots on the right the, the, like the telly this morning like this bloke said that i think the nurse should be paid more uh, but i don't think they should be on strike uh, so julia hartley brewer said well how does that work then how 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 are they going to get paid more and not go on strike and the bloke said well i don't know you know i don't know and and that is the answer they don't know do you know what i mean they literally come on and, and they get people come on and make stupid statements that are contradictory in terms and can't explain how they what they're recommending could possibly be achieved in the real world and this it's this uh, acceptance of the uh, illogicality things that on the prima facie are just undoable this uh, what I've always complained about the government dividing jobs into three piles things that are easy to do can be done straight away things that can be done with a bit of money or work and things that are totally impossible and then the, the totally impossible things they ignore <coughs> until they've done the other two and then they realize that they can't do what they wanted to do because of this third group means that the, all the work they've done is useless because they're you know they're trying to fit a square peg in a round hole and the government are they're constantly coming on saying in addition to um, the, the, the other buzzword they use is independent, independent. And it's always used in connection with independent pay review body. Uh, and so they say, look, we've implemented what the independent pay review body has suggested for the nurses. And therefore, we can't understand why they've gone on strike. And let, let me just first of all, knock the fact that this independence and the, the press nearly, it never challenges this. I had to deal with the doctors and dentists review body or the review body on doctors and dentists remuneration, as they are called, uh, for, for 20 years or so. And there is nothing independent about it. They work very closely with government. They have back channels to government. They're appointed by government. They're removed by government. And if they make a recommendation that the government doesn't want them to or, or doesn't want to pay, then um, they get removed like uh, Trevor Holdsworth uh, was the uh, chairman of the doctors and dentists review body. He made a recommendation, the government didn't like what he'd done. He went against what they wanted, and so they next year he was history. He was toast. So, hang on a second. Let's get through here without crashing into anything. So, but they always say, oh no, it's an independent review body. And if they say, you know, do you think it's fair that MPs pay have gone up, it's gone up 28% in the last five years or 10 years and a nurse's pay hasn't gone up at all they will say well as an MP my pay is not set by me it's, set, it's not set by MPs it's set by the independent review body and this was agreed that we'll have nothing to do with it we gave a, the, the task of setting our pay to an independent review body and so therefore you can't say that the, you know you don't have a point but I mean the, the reason why MPs gave their task of setting their pay to an independent review body was because they knew bloody well it wouldn't make the slightest bit of difference to what they were going to get paid you know there's no way the independent review body wasn't going to understand one way or the other through front channels back channels or i don't know by by uh, uh, having a drink on the lord's terrace or in the commons bar what the government thinking was on government pay So don't for a second think they're independent. The whole point about the independent word is just for people, for them to distance themselves from it, you know. It's just, it's a very old trick. It's the, the old quango, the quasi-autonomous non-governmental organisation that's been around since the 50s and the 60s. What you do is you, if you want to uh, uh, distance yourself from an unpopular decision, you create a, an intermediate tier, you know, like a meta uh, tier of um, decision making and you delegate the decision to them while at the same time only giving them the money to fund what what you want done and like in the terms of like local government for example i mean they um, pretty much know what they'd like the rates to be and they know what they'd like to subsidize the local authorities and so what they do is they say well look you're um you know you can get yourself elected and you can make a decision about what you spend but just don't ask us to send you any more money than we were going to send you anyway so high spending local authorities who would have had the support of their electorate 
for that high spending can't can't exercise their autonomy because even if they say right we're going to uh, double spending <clears throat> on I don't know uh, say libraries for example and as a result we're going to double the rates to pay for our double of spending and the electors say yes that's a great idea we'll support you on that we'll double the rates so double the rates and then but then they find that when they um, come to look at their budget they they don't have the money they won't they won't get that money because it's effectively the government says no i'm sorry you know we don't care that you've got this popular high spending policy we're, we're not going to fund it take a breath i'm going to take a breath all right Anyway, independence is not independence, and um, you know any more than the Care Quality Commission is independent, any more than the General Dental Council is independent, you know, any more than the British Dental Association is independent. You know, they even the British Dental Association is dependent upon the government for uh, various uh, grants and uh, awards and uh, trade union status and continuation of the self-employed status of dentists without too much scrutiny, blah blah blah. Nobody, the government makes sure that nobody's independent of government. You know, they've got their tendrils are everywhere. They make sure their tendrils are everywhere. That's because that's they're the government, aren't they? And it's their job to uh, say how everything should happen and how everything does happen. And that's why society as a whole is what I call collectivist. We are we live in a society where certain people think that they are able to make decisions and are better than the the population are making decisions on a collective level we live in a collective and not a good collective like the Borg where everybody gets a decision but a bad collective like the former USSR where uh, the government sets the price of everything from the price of money down to the price of um... here we go white van GF 65 XGB down, down to the price of money, down to the price of women's fashion, you know. And the price of fuel, um, which is a whole other subject, the price of fuel. Because remember when I said earlier that, uh, you know, they printed too much money. And as a result, there's no, uh, the, the purchasing power of the pound has been reduced because there's far more pound notes in circulation than there are goods and services. Well, the answer to that, obviously, is um, to produce more goods and services. But we're limited at the moment in terms of energy. Goods and services are produced through the use of energy. This, you look at like, all the cars here. They're all, all the vans delivering stuff, all the diggers over there. Uh, they're all um, using energy. And at the moment, energy is so expensive that we're not, we can't produce any more goods and services. M not much more, anyway. Because, it, you know, it gets to a point where it's not really cost effective. And so we're going to have a continued period of high inflation. I, I anticipate, well, certainly inflation in the past has not been brought under control until interest rates uh, go, go above the rate of inflation. If you look at Paul Volcker in the 70s, he, he had to put inflation up to nine, um, interest rates up to 19% to get inflation under control. No. No, you're going to stay there. You're going to sit there all day, are you? Yeah, with your stupid beard and your sunglasses. Take your effing sunglasses off. You might be able to see a space in the traffic. So inflation came down pretty well then, only because it, it rewarded people to save rather than spend. Now, what do you what do you do when you can't put inflation up to nineteen percent because you cause a sovereign debt crisis and a default? On, on the government bonds. Well, how does it work? And the answer is it works. You have to have a sustained period of high inflation, which effectively wipes out the middle class because they're the purchasing power of any, any wealth that they've got <coughs> denominated in pounds is, um, uh, is wiped out to the point where you know, it costs <coughs> 9,000 pounds to buy a ham sandwich. So we all get poorer. The government's printed the money. The government spent it. 
and they're going to get it back. And you can't do that. You know, I mean, the way to make everybody wealthy is just not to print a million pounds and give everybody a million pounds. That just doesn't work. So the government prints money, the government spends it, and, and we all pay. We all pay. And that's what we're doing. We're coming to the start of a period where we're all going to pay. But we are all paying through 10%, uh, 11% inflation. Until such time as nobody can afford to buy anything and the um, the demand for goods and services falls. Um, so you get um you get a depression coupled with inflation called stagflation. Anyway, wanna, if you want to know about stagflation, Google it, look it up. Okay, there's been a bit, a bit of dental content today, isn't there? A little bit of an insight into the um, the dental strike and how strikes work. If you're ever thinking of leading the national strike, then give me a ring. I've got plenty more advice for you. Okay, right, I'm going to work. Have a lovely day. Bye.